Welcome to Discourse. I am Susil Pandey. Human rights are inalienable fundamental rights protected by local as well as international laws. Every individual is inherently entitled to such kind of laws regardless of their nation, location, religion, language, ethnic origin, and other identity factors. The conditions of human rights in Nepal come under questions against the backdrop of continuous agitation in Madhis and Indian blockade to Nepal. Today, I am going to talk with a human rights activist regarding these issues, such as what is the real condition of human rights in Nepal, how Indian blockade has been deterring Nepali people from enjoying their fundamental rights, including others. My guest today is Chairman of the National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Masnur Rahman. <laughs> Professor Mizanur, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you at this uh, wonderful uh, TV channel and yeah. in this your anchor program discourse. Okay. You are in Nepal for the purpose of having a meeting of a task force uh, about human rights. But I'm very sorry that you may be facing some inconvenience because of the Indian blockade today. Uh, now, nowadays, uh, Nepali people are suffering, being suffered because of the unofficial Indian blockade for the last two and a half months. What do you think about that? You know, uh, to be very frank, uh, when I uh, decided to come to Kathmandu, even I invited my wife to accompany me to come over here. Though the meeting, uh, she would not be attending the meeting, but I was supposed to attend the meeting. I wanted her to have a relaxed moment uh, and to go around the city and Nepal. But upon arrival, the situation that I am witnessing and whatever I have seen so far, uh, to say the least, I can only call it a human catastrophe. And this human catastrophe is being organized and manipulated uh, through state intervention uh, from outside. Mm -hmm. And that is the most unfortunate part. Uh, I can only say that how much we feel and empathize with the Nepali people, mm -hmm. and we are beside the people of Nepal in these very difficult times in their history when they should have been celebrating the uh, adoption of a new constitution, mm -hmm. which in my opinion, and you know that I'm a student of international law, mm -hmm. so as a student of law, I believe that the newly adopted Nepali constitution is by far probably the most progressive constitution that uh, the whole of this South Asian region uh, have. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, the Nepali people should have been celebrating uh, such a wonderful, democratic, progressive constitution. But unfortunately, they have been forced into living such a difficult time for no fault of theirs. And that is unfortunate. Yeah. What do you think? Isn't it Indian gross human rights violations to Nepal? You see, whenever uh, on a massive scale, the people are denied access to basic services. Yeah. When, say for example, the uh, hospitals uh, cannot serve uh, and cannot serve the patients on a regular basis, mm -hmm. when the hospitals are compelled to deny the people access to some of the emergency medical care as well. Yeah. When, for example, a dialysis patient mm -hmm. uh, who had been having dialysis every week mm -hmm. now has to wait two or three weeks yeah. before the next dialysis takes place, this is merely, I think, pushing the people towards death and towards their ultimate destruction. Mm -hmm. So I do not know whether there can be greater violation of human rights than what the Nepali people are facing and experiencing right now at this moment. Then how can we resolve such kind of crisis? Well, I think uh, number one is uh, the neighboring countries of Nepal they must understand the gravity of the situation mm -hmm. and uh, whatever might be the political considerations of individual states. But uh, people as such, people or a whole nation cannot be denied their basic right to self-determination, whether they are opting for a particular constitution or for a particular way of life. Yeah. This is number one. And number two, these are the critical times when the international community must come forward very definitely, very concretely, and help the people of Nepal 
to overcome the present impasse yeah. and probably, uh, you know, sort of ensure for them a normal life and a normal but, but situation. But Dr. Mizanur, what Nepali people used to say that now they are saying that they are not receiving any uh, kind of, uh, you know, any kind of support from international community. They are complaining like that. Uh, you know, that, that's again another very unfortunate part of the story. We know that whenever some of these human rights violations take place in other parts of the globe, we find a hue and cry in the international media, in the international press. Mm -hmm. But the situation so far, as I understand, and you mentioned that for more than two and a half months, you know, the people of Nepal have been suffering from the denial of their basic rights, mm -hmm. and they have been pushed into an inhuman and a very difficult uh, time of their life. I believe the international community must show its readiness to uh, stand up to this occasion and do the needful uh, in order to remedy the situation. So far, I'm, I, I, I completely agree with you that the international community has failed to uh, live up to its commitment and to live up to the commitment and pledge it has made through the United Nations organization as well. Okay, you are a chairman of National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh. As a neighbor of Nepal, very good neighbor of Nepal, Bangladesh, how can Bangladesh help Nepal in such a situation to maintain uh, human rights? You see, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Bangladesh considers Nepal to be uh, one of the most friendly countries with whom, uh, and you know, we take pride in our uh, heritage and a legacy of friendly relations, not only between the two states, but yeah. also among the people of these two countries. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that our uh, ambassador had been in touch with the Nepali government, mm -hmm. and so I think that the, gov the government of Bangladesh is in the process of uh, uh, sending emergency medical supplies to Nepal to ease the situation and also to send food supplies and other materials to the extent it is possible. But uh, from my behalf, what I can commit to you, to the Nepali people, is that upon my uh, return to the country, and I'll be returning tomorrow, hopefully, I will uh, try to uh, talk to the government, to the officers and high officials of the government, uh, and uh, sort of inform them the yeah. existing situation in Nepal, and also talk about the a necessity yeah. of Bangladesh coming forward with the kind of help that the Nepali people would need at this very difficult times. Uh -huh. Okay, let's talk about the human rights condition of South Asia, especially from Bangladesh. What is the real condition of human rights in Bangladesh nowadays? Uh, well, uh, you see, uh, I can tell you one thing, that we have made a fundamental change in the way that human rights are perceived in Bangladesh. You know, uh, some five, six years back, uh, when if you have ever asked anyone on the street the, what do they understand by human rights, they would have merely referred to civil and political rights. Yeah. But probably we have been able to change uh, uh, the paradigm, to make a shift in the paradigm in the sense mm -hmm. that we are now emphasizing more on economic, social, and cultural rights to be an integral part of human rights. Yeah. And I think uh, in the economic, social, and cultural rights arena, Bangladesh had been making tremendous development and way forward, though uh, probably I must also say that with respect to civil and political rights, we still need to go a long way in order to meet the expectations of the people of the country. Okay, how can Nepal and Bangladesh develop the culture of human rights together? Uh, well, that is one of the things that we have been sort of thinking and talking about for the last uh, two days in Kathmandu. We are thinking of devising a regional human rights mechanism. mechanism. It means uh, South Asian level. So at, the, at the South Asian yeah. level, you know. Uh, if right now it is not possible uh, through SARC or the, on the yeah. platform yeah. of the SARC. Because nonetheless, let me know that why does not uh, why does not have South Asia such kind of regional mechanism so far? Because other regional um, areas, yes, you, know, know, you know, they have already. Quite, quite interestingly and ridiculously, you know, this is the only region which lacks such a regional mechanism. All the other regions what already have... What may be the cause of that? You know, the, probably, we lack the political will and commitment to human rights and protection of human, human rights. rights of the people. I think 
the human rights in this part of the globe were more, uh, I think, flavored by political considerations rather than humane and humanitarian considerations. But the time has come for a change, a change in the true sense of the word. And that, that's the reason that uh, we are now working together. We mm -hmm. have a task force and we are committed to devising a South Asian human rights mechanism. Uh, we Yesterday, yeah. we made the Secretary General of SARC also, yeah. and we made our point at the SARC Secretariat that we would want the SARC Secretariat also to yeah. engage itself with the civil society organizations mm -hmm. and the national human rights institutions of the but, region but to come up with the regional mechanism. Let me know that so far as SARC itself is concerned, it seems ineffective. In well, uh, in many areas, uh, probably SARC could have done better than it has done. In some areas, there are progress. And in some areas, because of the SARC charter limitations, that no bilateral issue can be brought up and discussed. Therefore, uh, it has restrained SARC yeah. from effective intervention in times of uh, necessity. For example, I think the present situation in Nepal is one of the glaring examples. Yeah. You know, you are facing a human catastrophe here. Yeah. It's a man-made disaster. My so, question is, yeah. if SARC is always, or SARC remains always ineffective, what may be the significance of SARC? I think, I think that's a very legitimate question that the people of the region would be asking. That if an institution fails to deliver and, deliv and fails to deliver in times of utter necessity, then uh, I think very legitimately question, you know, people would be asking this question time and again. I think the time has come for SARC also to revisit its charter and see uh, that uh, uh, the issues which are universal in nature Say for the human catastrophe uh, that the Nepali people are facing today is yeah. nothing which is bilateral. Mm -hmm. It is nothing even which is national. I would say that this has a international transboundary implication and therefore the concern is universal. So this kind of universal issues must be dealt with by an organization like SARC. Otherwise, the existence of an regional organization like SARC becomes meaningless. But it becomes all of to the problem of South Asia. For example, now, SARC is very, it is not interested in what is happening. It is, it, it is tender, rendered into just a ceremonial institution. Yeah? Well, uh, I, I think, you know, whatever you were telling, I think it is the expression of uh, the utter frustration that the Nepali people have been pushed into right yeah. now. And uh, uh, probably I would also echo your sentiment. And uh, if this continues to happen with SARC, then I'm afraid that uh, uh, SARC is going to lose all its legitimacy yeah. in the near future. Professor Mizanur, you are now in human rights. Mm, you, you are a human rights activist and uh, you are spending your time and power in human rights. From the perspective of human rights, can you have any hope from the SARC? Well, we are, you know, as a matter of fact, the national human rights institutions of South Asia, as well as the civil society organizations, we have come together and we have realized that unless human rights agenda is taken up as one of the main agenda of SARC, then this regional organization is not going to have any meaningful significance for the people of this region. Therefore, the civil society, yeah. the people of uh, South Asia, they want that uh, SARC must engage itself more and more with the human rights promotion and protection activities. From that perspective, Despite the present uh, difficult situations, I believe that uh, the future lies with human rights promotion and protection. The future lies with a better human rights situation in South Asia as a region. And SARC can do that. Uh, you hope. Well, there, there are difficulties, but we are trying to make this, uh, you know, fundamental change within the structure of the SARC, within the SARC charter, I think it needs to be revisited and more and more human rights ingredients and elements must be uh, sort of infiltrated into the SARC charter so that it can live up to the challenges which the present day and the life uh, sort of uh, pushes us to face with. Do you have any new vision about the human rights condition to improve the human rights conditions in South Asia? You see, human rights, if we leave human rights merely as they state to take care of, then probably the things will change 
very, very slowly, if at all it changes. Therefore, for a human rights that is culture... What happening in Saudi Asia, yeah? yeah? Uh, so, 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 you know, in order to bring about a fundamental change and in order to establish a human rights culture throughout the region, we need to increase people-to-people -people yeah. contact in the oh. region. So, people of Bangladesh and Nepal, people of India and Nepal, people of Pakistan and India. So, this, you know, connectivity between and among the peoples mm -hmm. must also be extended and expanded in order that human rights are uh, treated more seriously by the respective governments and by the state's members of SAR. Then the question blooms over here as to how can we develop enhance the people-to-people -people relationship among the South Asian countries? You see, uh, if you have noticed over the years that people's SARC has been playing a very crucial role and whenever the SARC summits are held, people's uh, SARC also meets. And they have already established themselves as a platform of the civil societies of South Asia to represent the people of South Asia and ventilate their aspirations, their, their demands to the SARC Secretariat and to the, uh, you know, the heads of government and states of the uh, SARC countries. I think that's a very good beginning. So things are changing and the more the civil society organizations would interact between and among themselves, mm -hmm. I think this people's uh, SARC would become much more vibrant and a very important actor in the uh, sort of phase of creating and establishing a human rights culture in the region. But does it seem possible within some years, some decade? Uh, well, you see, uh, giving any time uh, line is very difficult, you know, to anticipate or to prognose. But, but uh, you know, let me again be very optimistic because things in South Asia have been changing very fast. And people... Uh, and even at the grassroots level, they are more inclined to see uh, a state playing more pro-human uh, rights friendly role uh, in the respective countries. And that is something that we must uh, note uh, very carefully because this is going to bring about a fundamental change uh, how the states are being governed in South Asia and human rights can no longer be ignored and denied in this part of the globe. But the problem seems over here, for example, the countries of South Asia, uh, they are not connected to each other as they should be. Well, for, well, for, the, the, for example, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the process, and there is no uh, a common market among the South yes, Asian exactly. region also. You know, you know, that's the point that I was just making, that this, you know, connectivity between and among people must be expanded and extended. Therefore, mm. a visa-free South Asia. Yeah. That is something uh, that has to be made. You have countries they are doing, they are practicing such, such kind of... Exactly. In, in, you know, the other regions, yeah. they have gone so far ahead of us. So we cannot be lagging behind. So the time has then come what for is the... that, that very problem? Well, that, that, is, that is taking us behind. You know, sort of, we have been probably very much, uh, I think, uh, I, I would say uh, nationalistic in a narrow sense. With but... Uh, Physical boundary. With, yeah, <laughs> thinking only of our territorial boundaries and confining ourselves within the territorial boundaries. But uh, you see, human life in, t in, in today's world, in the 21st century, is not something uh, that you know, the state sovereignty can mm -hmm. restrain or a state sovereignty can define. Mm -hmm. The concept of sovereignty is becoming obsolete day by day. And increasingly, it is losing its uh, uh, significance and importance. The world is my home. And I am a citizen of the world. More so, so this kind of South attitude must be developed. Exactly. This, Asia. this, you know, the new generation must be imbibed with the spirit of belonging to the world, belonging to the region, yeah. and uh, despite our individual differences and individual way of looking at the things and problems. But Professor Mizan, one very simple question. I am not going to blame India, but some analysts say that, analyze that it is because of India, which does not have very good relations with its neighbors. It is said by the analyst. Yeah, I'm not saying that myself. That's not my statement. Because of India also, South Asia or South Asia Regional Cooperation SARC is rendered very ineffective. Uh, you Does see, it have any truth? No, you see, uh, you know, uh, very often we have seen that the chemistry between India and Pakistan have led to a situation whereby SARC could not 
probably play its anticipated role. Mm -hmm. And uh, to that extent, it was uh, sort of, it became ineffective. Mm -hmm. However, you see, uh, how far India is to be blamed, uh, that's something for the analyst to decide. But uh, from my you know, personal yeah. viewpoint, I can tell you that being the largest democracy in the world, India as a state must realize that as the biggest country in South Asia, as the, as we call it, the big brother, it must uh, He's not a leader also. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> it, it, it must show yeah. it's, uh, you know, uh, that it, it, it uh, has extra and additional responsibilities towards the younger brothers and sisters of the same region. Mm -hmm. And I think the political leadership in India definitely will demonstrate that maturity uh, whereby they will be respecting the rights and privileges of the member countries of South, and in so doing, they'll earn the respect and love of uh, the rest of the members of South. It is also said that such kind of big brother attitude of India is adversely affecting the human rights conditions of South Asia. Uh, well, these are very common allegations which are labeled against uh, not only India, but I would say that any big country, you know, and when you have the smaller countries neighboring with the big country, it is always that the uh, smaller countries have this kind of problem with the bigger countries. So it's not only merely in South Asia that happens even, you know, if, if you see uh, North America. So uh, say, for example, the relationship of Mexico vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the United States of America yeah. is almost alike, you know. Yeah. So this is something of a universal trend. Yeah. But here, what I must emphasize, that the values which India has nurtured for centuries, that would ultimately, you know, take the upper hand. And I believe that the friendly relations between and among the uh, states of uh, South Asia and the people of South Asia yeah, yeah. would be would be the ultimate truth and prevail in the long then, run. I'm very eager to know that. Let me know that. How can we change such kind of attitude, being a big brother and a small brother, or very law of a pond like big piece can eat small piece? This kind of attitude. How no, you can see, we, uh, you see, in, in the old labor, how uh, do you take this kind of initiation no, see, from South Asia? The other day, before I left for Nepal, I saw in one of the popular uh, and um, dailies, English dailies of Bangladesh, I saw a statement given by the uh, Prime Minister of Nepal, where he says that, uh, you know, gone are the days when another country could have interfered in the internal affairs of a country like Nepal. I think this is the truth that must be realized by the states persons of South Asia, and not only South Asia, but anywhere in the globe, you know? Yeah. So those old days of politics are gone. Those old days of bipolar world are gone. So this is a new world, and in this new world, new rules and regulations are there, which would be guiding and uh, sort of defining the relationship of uh, um, between and among states, i.e. defining international relations as such. And there, I am pretty sure that this big brotherly attitude of certain countries ultimately would uh, uh, be even a futile and ridiculous exercise. It may be ridiculous some decade in the future, after some decade, but it is happening now. It's happening we now. Have, we have been that, suffered that, that, from that very, attitude. You know, it's very unfortunate, but at the same time, I think uh, you will agree with me that because of the incident that uh, and the situation that Nepalese people are facing today, yeah. the kind of support the, and the moral strength that you have today is not the moral uh, you know, strength that the others can claim vis-a-vis -vis Nepal today. Yeah. So I think ultimately it is the moral values, the moral strength, and the support for the Nepali people, the affinity with Nepal, Nepal mm -hmm. sympathy and empathy with Nepal, that will be winning the day and not the kind of animosity that is demonstrated by any yeah. particular state. And what do you think, what is the real condition of human rights in Nepal? Well, I think, you know, the constitution of Nepal pledges a society and a country where uh, the fundamental rights of the citizens should be protected and promoted. I was even surprised to see that the present constitution makes it incumbent upon the uh, state of Nepal to provide housing to all the citizens of Nepal within the next three years. You know, that is a promise which I hope that even my country would have made to its own citizens. Yeah. So I think 
that the future of human rights in Nepal is, I think, is a very bright, hopeful you know, future from where we, other South Asian countries, have a lot to learn and borrow from. But what we learn now is the human rights cannot be violated by the government of the same state. It can be violated by the uh, neighboring countries also. Or, well, this, this is the kind of situation that we are in, yes. Uh, not only here in this particular situation, but even in Syria or, for example, mm. in Libya or in Iraq or in Afghanistan, we have seen that the main perpetrator and main violator of human rights had not been the governments of the respective countries, but some powers from outside. So that, I think, is a new development in uh, human rights jurisprudence in the country, the way human rights are practiced. So this is a challenge for international law. This is a challenge for human rights jurisprudence. And I'm pretty sure that the universal values of human rights ultimately mm -hmm. will win over these challenges and they will be doomed to failure in the long run. Okay, Professor Mizanar, we are at the end of the program. What do you want to say to Nepali people? Uh, well, my message to the people of Nepal would be that uh, the people of Bangladesh, the National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh is with the people of Nepal. We love the people of Nepal and we salute the people of Nepal for having coming up with a constitution which is a lesson for the rest of the countries of South Asia. Okay, Professor Mizanar, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us time indeed. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. Okay. Thank you.